Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin ve salatu ve selamu ala seyyidina ve mevlana Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ve sellem. Allahümme umnun aleyna bi safa'il ma'rifa ve heb lana tasuhih el muamelati fi ma beynena ve beynaka an kitabi ve sunna. Ve rızıkna sifka tevakkuli aleyk ve husna zanni bik. Ve umnun aleyna bi kulli ma yukarribuna ileyk makrunen bi awafi ddarayn ya arhamar rahimim. All praise is due to Allah who has revealed himself to mankind in a plethora of exquisite names despite the unicity of his pristine essence in everything he has assigned that indicates that he is the one. Serene blessings of peace and security upon our beloved Muhammad, the best and most beloved to Allah of his creation and Allah knows best where to place his message. He is Allah's gift of mercy to the world and the stellar example of humanity. Verily, in the Messenger of Allah, you have a goodly example for those who hope in Allah. O Allah, bestow upon us the purity of knowing and give us the rectification of the business between us and you in accordance with the book and the sunnah. Sustain us with honesty in our reliance upon you, and with good opinion in your regard, bestow upon us everything that will draw us nearer to yourself, joined with good health in the two houses of this life and the next. Ameen. Barakallahu feekum, ahsanallahu ilaykum. We've reached the 11th chapter of Riyadh al-Salihin, alhamdulillah. Tawfiq from Allah, the chapter of Mujahada, spiritual struggle, making an effort to get near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether that's opposing the desires of the ego, or whether it is resisting the cruelty of an enemy directed towards innocent people, it is the calling of the believer. It is the way of the Muhsin. Imam al Nawawi begins his chapter with the verse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَالَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا لَنَهْدِيَنَّهُمْ سُبُولَنَا And those who make effort, those who would struggle in us, Allah says, in me, Allah says, in my way for my sake, we will guide them to our paths. The path to the contentment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The path to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna Allaha lama'al muhsineen. Indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is verily with those who do ihsan. Here in this verse, the first thing that happens is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Man jahada fina. الَّذِينَ جَاهَدُوا فِينَا Those who make jihad in our way. Jihad is not going away. We can't sweep it under the rug. It's part and parcel of the way of Islam and that's not going to change. But what needs to happen is rather than hiding from it, like it will go away, we need to reclaim it and define it and look at its parameters. Look at its principles. It's right there in the Qur'an. It's right there in the Qur'an. And it is a significant part of Islam. And the final aspect of the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala links it to Ihsan. Ihsan is a word that derives from Hasan, which is good which is goodness, which is wholesomeness. So there is no jihad without wholesomeness. There is no jihad without goodness. And ihsan is to do good by others, to bring what is hasan and healthy and wholesome to others, to bring it to what is to the earth, to bring it to the people that populate the earth. And the essence of what is good in its own sake for the people who populate the earth is that they find their way to their creator. And the only way to get to the creator 
It's through Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who is sent as a gift of compassion and mercy to them. So any type of jihad that would block someone or steer someone in the wrong direction away from accepting their creator or realizing that the intention and purpose of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in this life is what is in their very best interest. And the confidence of a person who's trying to find their way in the world, their confidence, that one individual's confidence that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has his best interest at his foremost intent and purpose of his mission, that is the secret of all of this. So we cannot have people who claim to represent the Prophet والسلام, out there pushing people away from the Prophet SubhanAllah. Whoever makes an effort, in this one verse, whoever makes an effort in us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for our sake, we will guide them to our ways, the ways that lead to Allah's contentment for all eternity. The people who achieve Allah's contentment, not just for a moment in their lives, but for all eternity, they all end up in one place. That's the Jannah al Firdaus al A'la. In the neighborhood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the companions of Muhammad, and the best people that walk the face of the earth, that's where those people end up, and those are the subul, the ways of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah puts into this verse an element of instruction as to the way reality operates. Whoever makes an effort in the way of our pleasure will end up in our contentment, will end up in our path, and in that is the secret of another verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises that He won't allow the effort of any male or female person to go to waste. Right? All of it will be accounted for, all of it will be, hmm, will be recorded for them, will be given consideration. He says, an effort, ajara, ajara. That includes any effort, even the slightest. The most beloved actions to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the most consistent, even if just a little bit. Protect yourself from the fire, even with half a date. The smallest effort is included in this verse. And you know that if you make that effort, if you make that effort, Allah will put you on His path. Right? One plus one equals two. And there you go. Hmm? We have confidence and i'tiqad, conviction, in that promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's part and parcel of iman. All of it is right here. Whoever makes an effort in a way that is pleasing to us for our sake, we will guide them. And Allah is with the people of Ihsan, who do good by others. A brief uh, principle of tafsir is that if people are looking for new insights into the Qur'an, right, it has to be uh, within the boundaries of how Arabic grammar works and also syntax. So you can't take this lamb that is then attached to the word with, lama'a, so it's a lamb of emphasis, attached to the word, verily Allah is with. And you can't make it a new word that says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, al-muhsinin is muhsinin huh? because it's majroor, right? Not because it's mansoor. So you can't change muhsinin to the case of nasib, making it a direct object, and then lama'a goes from being la ma'a, verily with, to Allah brightens and shines and makes the people of goodness lama'an, shiny, right? Allah makes the people of goodness shiny, right? You can't do that because the Arabic syntax doesn't allow for it. 
subhanallah. In the next verse in this chapter, وَعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ right, So here is the mudawama, the enduring nature of making an effort in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not for a period of your life. Right? We're always trying to move in the direction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're always trying to consider what is huh, in the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worship your Lord until the certainty comes. And what certainty? Two things. What are the two things you can be certain of? Death and taxes, right? Good. Doubt. وَالْكُرِسْمَ رَبِّكَ وَتَبَتَّلْ إِلَيْهِ تَبَتِيلًا Remember the name of your Lord and devote yourself to Him in complete and utter devo devotion. Turn yourself to Him and uh, remove yourself from concerns for anything else. Sequester yourself in the devotion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Cut yourself off from being devoted to other. Hmm? Dedicate uh, yourself, your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No. So He's defining mujahada spiritual effort through the verses that he leads with. And another, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرَيْ يَرَهُ Whoever makes an Adam's weight of effort, of good, huh, will see it, will see the reward for it. That's a guarantee of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا تُقَدِّمُوا لِأَنفُسِكُمْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ تَجِدُوهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ هُوَ خَيْرًا وَأَعْظَمَ أَجَرًا and whatever you put forward for yourself in your hisab, in your account with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of goodness, you will find it with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even better and with a greater reward. Uh, because you're thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you put this forward for a rainy day where you're going to need it, right? You can cash it in. But what are those things? It's not a matter of like, I'm not good with video games, or like Super Mario Brothers or whatever it is, you run along the thing and you jump up and you grab the little gold medallion or something and you score points and then that goes in your record and you're competing with someone else, right? We're not elementary school kids, huh? That's how they think. Thank you for your hasanat, right? So-and-so took my hasanat. right? No, it's not about racking up hasanat as much as it is Choosing the content of the action. So there's intransitive devotion that you do for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is your pure uh, dedication of your heart to Allah. When you turn to Allah or you think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when engaged in an act of devotion, but then there's the transitive acts of devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you do a kindness to another person. Whoever relieves a burden, whoever le relieves or lifts an anxiety from his brother, Allah will relieve for them an anxiety for them on the Day of Judgment. But certain things cancel out that effort. If the effort to help another person comes along with men, what is men? It comes along with men, al imtina. Huh? Then that cancels out the effort. So if when I give my zakat, I have to lord it over someone or make someone feel bad about the fact that I'm giving it to them or look down on them or give them a lecture. If I'm pulling zakat out of my pocket, it's still in my hand, who does it belong to? It belongs to the first person who shows up and qualifies for it. So while it's still in my pocket, while it's still in my, as they would say, billfold, right? Billfold, right? It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to them. So what am I supposed to do? Hurry up and get it to them because I'm in sin until they get it. Or the first person that comes along gets it. So what am I doing going and trying to humiliate the owner of this? You know what's going to happen to this person? What goes around comes around. I go and I try to humiliate someone to make myself feel better. It's not only enough that Allah has done well by me and has not 
has chosen to test this person, what do I run the risk of? Losing everything in the process and having a bad ending. That cancels out all of these efforts. So we need to be careful about how we deliver. SubhanAllah. Abu Huraira was one of the people of the Sufa. Which of us is better than Abu Huraira? Protestant worth ethic doesn't work in the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We got to get that right, or else we're going down as a community. But back to the positive. Wa ma tunfiqu min khairin fa inna Allah bihi alim. And people don't notice what you're doing. You know your intention. Allah knows your intention. And Allah sees what you do. Is that enough for us? Is that satisfactory enough that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw and knows? When we sit or sat up in our graves, we're sat up alone no matter how many friends we had. And it's only going to matter what Allah saw. Huh? SubhanAllah. Allah help us. Allah. So the first hadith of the Ba'ab. The first hadith of the Ba'ab. We narrate Riyadh al-Salihin, or I narrate Riyadh al-Salihin from Dr. Nuruddin Itar, from his Shaykh al-Alamat al-Muhaddad Abdullah Siraj al-Din, and I narrate, Alhamdulillah, 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 the works of Imam al-Nawawi from Dr. Muhammad Muti al-Hafiz, Allah protect him, and he narrates from Shaykh Salih, Sheikh Salih Muhammad Abu Khair Midani, عن عبد الله السكري عن عبد الرحمن الخزبري الحفيظ عن مصطفى الرحمة عن الشيخ الفقي عبد الغني النابوسي عن النجم محمد الغزي عن والده البدر الغزي عن شيخ الإسلام زكريا الأنصاري عن الحافظ الشهاب أحمد بن حجر عن أبي إسحاق إبراهيم التنوخي عن علاء الدين علي بن عن علي بن العطار عن الإمام المحدث الفقي يحيى بن شرف النووي with his سند to أبي هريرة رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إن الله تعالى قال من عاد لي وليا فقد آذنته بالحرب. Whoever shows animosity to a friend of mine, the Prophet والسلام, This is a hadith Qudsi, in which the Prophet والسلام, narrates revelation from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in his own words, not as part of the Quran in which he reports that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever shows animosity to a friend of mine, I declare war on them. SubhanAllah. Whoever shows animosity to a friend of Allah. And truly, who is the friend of Allah? Who is the wali? Who are the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Well, the first level of wilaya is La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And it just goes from there. There are people that we feel comfortable referring to as awliya. But Allah knows their reality. Those who are famous for being referred to as awliya, their life is complete. They've passed away. And everyone who knew them from their generation and the generation after them knew that these people were never known to have ever deviated from the teachings of Allah and His Messenger وسلم. They were known to have lived this excellent life, but who ultimately knows the reality? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if the Muslim community refers to someone as a wali, that still as if it's in the maqam or the station of husn al -ran. Having a good opinion of those people. Making a dua for those people. Because they lived a life as far as we know that was representative of 
all that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in referring to that person and their life and legacy, it's almost as if it is a celebration of taqwa. But ultimately, only Allah knows who the awliya are. We don't know. So if we don't know who the awliya are, if we don't know who the awliya are, and the awliya can make minor sins. And the awliya will not persist in those minor sins or persist in kaba'ya. We don't know the secrets of a person's tawbah. So, ultimately, we do not know who the awliya are, but it could be anyone who said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And if we don't want to find ourselves in a position where Allah is declaring war on us, we'd be best advised to be careful who we show animosity toward. Right? That's the way to operate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then goes on to talk about mujahada, spiritual huh, effort. وَمَا تَكَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِنْ مَفْتَرَدْتُ عَلَيْهِ And my slave does not draw nearer or make approach to me with anything more beloved to me than what I have made obligatory for him or her. If someone wants to know how to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, iltazim al faraid That's the first step. وَمَا يَزَالُ عَبْدِي يَتَقَرَّبُ إِلَيَّ بِالنَّوَافِذِ حَتَّى أُحِبَّهُ And my slave does not cease to draw ever closer to me with voluntary actions, whether that's extra fasting, extra raka'at, extra sadaqat, or extra effort to bring goodness to the earth and the world around them. All of those are ways of drawing nearer to Allah. He does not cease to do this huh? until I love him. فَإِذَا أَحْبَبْتُهُ كُنْتُ سَمْعَهُ الَّذِي يَسْمَعُ بِهِ And when I love my slave, I am the hearing with which he or she hears. وَبَصَرَهُ الَّذِي يُبْصِرُ بِهِ And his sight by which he sees, right? Fear the insight of the believer. فَإِنَّهُ يَنْظُرُ بِنُورِ اللَّهِ Fear the insight of the believer because he sees by a light or by the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If Allah is the vision by which you see, that's some serious sadad. Saddidu wa qaribu. What? Hitting the target. Sadad. That's some sure vision. Huh? That's some sure vision. That's the ultimate sure shot. Subhanallah. Seeing with the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa yadahu allati yabtishu biha. And the hand with which he clasps. Whether it is just the precision of his own hand or the precision of his efforts or her efforts in what they're trying to accomplish or they're trying to affect in the world, subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is by Allah, it is for Allah, it is in Allah, it is from Allah, it is to Allah. And that's how that effort comes about. And his foot by which he walks. So how is Allah the foot by which a person walks? How is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the hand? How is Allah the eye? How is Allah the hearing? Right? I'm no longer getting the reports wrong. I heard some hearsay. I heard some gossip and I went and I acted on it and I made people's lives miserable and I was completely wrong. The person who hears by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is protected. This is the essence of tawfiq. This is the tasdeed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if we make an effort but we have that reservation and that worry, that hesitation, thinking that, well, is it really going to work out? Did I really do it right? Did I get it right? Do I even know what I'm doing? Well, drawing nearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a way to bring tawfiq to your efforts because these statements are a metaphor for the tawfiq and the success of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah is coming and uh, 
huh? making precise a person's effort, and where does the precision of efforts come from? In the seeking with good intention and right intention, not foul attention, uh, 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 intention or wrong intention to get near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this same abad, وَلَا إِنْ سَأَلَنِي And if he asked me, if she asked me, I give him, I give her. What in is And if she uh, seeks refuge uh, from anything that she fears or that he fears, I give them that refuge. I give him, I give her that protection. And this is in Al Bukhari, Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, in the second hadith. عن أنس رضي الله عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فيما يرويه عن ربه another hadith قدسي إذا تقرب العبد إلي شبرا تقربت إليه ذراعا وإذا تقرب تقرب إلي ذراعا تقربت منه باعا وإذا أتاني يمشي أتيته هرولا is one of my most favorite ahadith ever. It's one of the most hopeful ahadith that you will ever find. And if my slave draws near to me by a hand span, I draw near to him or her by an arm's length. And if my slave draws near to me an arm's length, I draw nearer to him two arms span. And if he comes to me walking, I come to him running. Are we supposed to understand physical distance between us and Allah? Are we supposed to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as running? Are we supposed to understand that if you just make a small effort, Allah will give you back a double effort from Himself. Does it get any better than that? Make an effort dedicated to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And like I always say, if right now at this point in your life, all that you can do is that when you wake up in the morning, is look up and put up one finger and say, La ilaha illallah, or Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah Muhammad or Rasulullah. That's all you can do. That's an effort. That counts as an effort, and Allah will double it. SubhanAllah. You just make the siru ilallahi arjan wa makasiya. Right? That narration begins with, La tantadiru saha. Don't wait for good health. Journey to Allah, even if broken and crippled, you make a small effort and you dedicate it to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know it's for Allah because you're all alone. You know it's for Allah because you don't have anyone. You know it's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there's no audience for you to show off to. Except for that sad person that might even be praying alone in the middle of the night to Hajjud and imagining all the people watching and saying, wow, he looks real good standing there. There's a lost it all, and nobody even saw. Right? But you got no one. It's only for Allah. That small little bit. Drag yourself in Allah's direction. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is alimun bihi. He didn't say in the other narr uh, narration or in the verse, right? Alimun. He knows it. He said he is excessively and intensively knowledgeable, meaning the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and here is your aqidah in effect. You know that the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encompasses all things inwardly and outwardly, and no leaf falls from the tree except for the path of how it floats and makes its way to the earth is known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's nothing in the soil, nothing in the heavens except that is known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how it is, when it is, huh? when it starts, when it ends, where it comes from, where it's going. Nothing escapes, including your effort. Right? Including your effort. SubhanAllah. Ya Rabbi, give us.
Miss Kofi. The third hadith from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma, who said that the Messenger alayhi salatu wa salam said, Ni'matan maghboonun fihima kathirun min nas Two blessings. So many of the people hmm, lose out on these two blessings, get swindled out of these two blessings. as good health, and free time. SubhanAllah. So who's doing the swindling? The same slave, swindling himself, not acting in his own best interest. Allahumma help us to act in our own best interest. Allah bless us to act on what we know and benefit from what we've learned. And the fourth hadith from Sayyida Aisha, radiallahu anha, أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم كان يقوم من الليل حتى تتفطر قدماه. And we all know this hadith that the Prophet والسلام, would stand up in night, at night until his feet would swell up and crack from the difficulty of standing for a long time. And it's the sunnah to stand longer. Right? Some modern Muslims who learn Islam from modern books. They think that sujood makes more sense to make the sujood longer, but it's the standing and the elongation of the standing that is the virtue uh, in the deen. And the Prophet ﷺ would stand longer than any human being was able to stand. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Aisha says that, I said to him, why do you do this, Messenger of Allah? And Allah has already told you that he's forgiven you from any of your faults that went before and any of your shortcomings that will come after. And here he says in his return, the essence of jihad, the essence of mujahada, afala uhibbu and akuna abdan shakuran. Well then shouldn't I be grateful for that by doing all of this? Huh? Not out of fear and not out of want, out of shukr. Huh? For the ni'am, for the blessings, the one who stands and the one who makes an effort and the one who gives back to the world around them, just to be grateful for that blessing that you're able to notice when your mind is overwhelmed by everything else that's going wrong, but it could be worse. Huh? There's all this other stuff that went right, and I'm going to go and I'm going to do this Shukran lillah, shakirina li Allah, subhanAllah, out of gratefulness, subhanAllah. Ya ala Dawood, ya amalu shukra, O family of Dawood, go and make some gratefulness, some thanksgiving. The next hadith number five is also from Sayyida Aisha, radiallahu anha, one of the ulama of this ummah, annaha qalat, كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا دخل العشر أحيا الليل وأيقظ أهله وجد وشد المئزرة. And she says that the messenger عليه الصلاة والسلام, if the last ten days of Ramadan came into effect, he would give life to the night. Doing ibadah in the middle of the night is giving life to the night. And he'd wake up his family, the people of his house, to also do the same. With Jeddah, and he would take it seriously, and he'd tie his belt tight. Right? He'd tie his belt tight. Right? Meaning, no hanky-panky the last ten days, right, of Ramadan, because he was serious. SubhanAllah. He was focused on making an effort to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and did he need, mean to make, need to make that effort? He was already there. He wanted to show shukr, but he also serves as an example to us. Inspiring. Inspiring. No. Well, muradu. Right? And so on. And Imam Nawawi has some explanation here. Allah, the sixth hadith, 
is from Abu Huraira, radiallahu anhu qad, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-mu'minu al-qawiyu khayrun wa ahabu ila Allahi min al-mu'min al-da'if wa fi kullin khayr. The strong believer is better and more beloved to Allah than the weaker believer. And in all of them is good. Stronger in faith, stronger in body, stronger in influence. No. Stronger and more direct and resolute in his or her effort. No. Why? Because of the volume and ability to make ihsan, which is the essence of mujahada that we've seen. Subhanallah. But what if the believer in question, percentage-wise, has assets and strength and capital and ability and skills, but does not deploy them in the mujahada of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and bring ihsan to the world around them, there's all of this physical, dunyawi, secular, categorized strength, but it's not deployed with correct intention. And then we have this other one who is physically less able, who is financially less able, but, or educationally less endowed, but percentage-wise deploys more of that in ihsan and mujahada in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well then who's the stronger at this moment and who's the weaker? Who's the stronger and who's the weaker at this point? Because a person may have all types of physical strengths but be weak of, of, of resolve and weak of heart and need to validate themselves by putting down another person. Huh? By being nasty toward another person. By undermining another person in celebration of the gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them not from their effort because there are people out there that labor and that work and that sweat and don't get the same return from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's their test that is between them and Allah. Will they be patient? Will they be such and such? And others that don't expend that much effort but stuff just flows in. What did uh, Kenya Barra say the other night, last week? Said that I've never seen a person running for president that when there was always a step that needed to be taken that was a correct and right step and a wrong step that always chose the wrong thing to say, the wrong thing to do that actually achieved what they were after. It's as if this person, right, if they fell and stumbled, they would fall into a diamond mine. On Wall Street. <laughs> you know, so uh, at the end of the day, each scenario is between that person and Allah, and they're being tested. SubhanAllah. Right now, you know, like 30 miles north of us, they said that 3,500 homes and businesses have been burnt to the ground. In a span of 15 minutes, I heard one report that 11 people have died and another that 22 people died, both on the radio. And 280 people are missing or unaccounted for. SubhanAllah. Allah bring relief. This is our particular place and this is our space and we're smelling and inhaling the smoke 30 miles away from what's going on. Here is a tragedy that's befallen people. We shouldn't be quick to just assume that, oh, it's fire, so maybe we should be taking the idea of the hellfire, or maybe this is some punishment that's come to them. I think that our community has gotten beyond those silly assumptions, right? The way that the usul works is that there's floods, there's earthquakes, uh, there's uh, wildfires and there's all different types of tragedies you abstract it out doesn't matter what the exact tragedy is it's all human tragedy
right? It's all human tragedy, and it all is a source of empathy. Allah bring relief to people, right? And Allah let Muslims be the manifestation of his lutuf and his jama'ah and his inayah in the earth, in the rahmah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah protect these people and keep them safe. And among them, right, how, uh, a great many of the people who are working to fight the fires directly, face to face with the fire. Everyone else hopefully is getting evacuated in time and Allah protect their homes and the homes that remain, but there's people who are face to face with the fire. A lot of them are volunteers, a lot of them are paid employees who work in the fire brigades, right? But a great many of them are prisoners, right? Thousands and thousands of prisons are emptying out huh, the prisoners to actually put them face to face with the fire. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect them. <laughs> There are people that, you know, you go to a court, you commit a crime, you do something wrong, inshallah, the evidence is correct, right? And you get a sentence. That sentence is the punishment for the crime that you've done. And more often than not, right, it may be incarceration. Okay, so being separated from some of your particular civil liberties is the sentence to pay for what you've done. Any abuse and above and beyond that is not the person's punishment. So that a sentence has been passed on a person doesn't mean that they're available for abuse. We have the sheriff in what, Arizona who's trying to abuse and humiliate people beyond the actual sentence for their crime. This in and of itself is a crime in Islamic law that is worthy of punishment, right? And the people who perpetrate these crimes, right, themselves need to be sentenced. So taking people and putting them in danger, <laughs> already in a situation where people think that they're just there to be kicked around and punished and abused and humiliated even further is a dangerous situation. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of those people who are being put out there and keep them safe. And keep them safe. Inshallah, if people, there's groups out there that are watching out from them, given that it's a prison population, what percentage of them are most likely Muslim? Because people in this country convert to Islam in prison, right, with great frequency. So we even have Muslim brothers and sisters who are out there clearing brush and face to face with the fire. Right? If we have prison chaplains, I hope that they're out there checking up on their own constituency. Right? That's a responsibility to be asking. Inshallah, maybe, you know, how many masajid have opened up their doors as refugee centers, like the schools and the churches that are doing that, for non-Muslims to come in, you know, particularly the ones that have space to do it. So a lot that could be done. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala illumine our conscience collective conscience. So, where are we? Back to the affair at hand. Fi kullin khayr. Ihris ala ma yanfa'uka. Look out for, be covetous of, what is the word that they use in the translation? Aaron, in hadith number six. Ihris ala ma yanfa'uka. It says, um, desire whatever could be a benefit for you. Desire, or be keen on getting a hold of those things that benefit you. If you know that this is going to benefit you in a wholesome way in the dunya, in an eternal and enduring way in the akhirah, then prioritize it. Wasta'in <coughs> and take care of it. That's also al hirs right? Take care of it, protect it. Wasta'in billahi. So if there's things that will benefit you in your long term, that will make you a better human being, that will bring benefit to you in your akhirah, then be careful. 
take care of it, celebrate it, protect it, because that is an investment, that is a source that is going to bring you benefit in the long term, no less than we might protect to make sure that our Bugatti or our Ducati doesn't get a scratch on it. What about these other things? If you have a Mus'haf in your home, protect it. Treat it well. It's not that hard. We'll all put it up on the top shelf, right? And mashallah, the pages never get wrinkled. But what about the ability to understand what is in between those two covers? SubhanAllah. The ability to drink from the timeless meanings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's eternal sifat al kalam. Ya Rabbi. Wasta'in billahi wa la ta'ajiz. Here's your mujahida, right? And seek aid from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and don't act like you're handicapped. That's what it says. Ta'ajiz, the real ajiz, the person who is mu'awwaq and actually has a physical handicap is not included in this verse. So what it really means is quit act, acting crippled, right? Because some of us, we do that. La ta'ajiz. The Arabs say, don't act like your ajiz. Huh? Right? Don't act like your ajiz. Wa in asabaka shay'un fala taqul lo anni fa'altu kada kana kada. And if something goes wrong for you, don't say, well, if only this happened, such and such would happen. Or if only I'd done this, this would have happened. And what's worse than that? If only so and so had done that for me, I wouldn't be in this situation now putting the blame on others or making excuses. What transpired is what was in Allah's design and your job now is to react in the moment according to what has transpired in Allah's design. So if we got to make a little bit of tawbah, right? We make a little bit of tawbah. Or a lot of tawbah. Ya Rabbi, to Alayna. What I can could instead say, Qaddar Allahu wa ma sha'a fa'al. Allah decreed something and did what he wanted. Right? This is the decree of Allah and I accept the decree of Allah and I realize that I'm responsible to make good choices from here on out, given huh, the scenario that has been designed by the decree of Allah. فَإِنَّ Because if only, the words if only opens up a door for the shaytan. Huh, to do what? To play with your aqidah, huh? to play with your approach to the world and your worldview. When we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the shayateen of men and jinn. Amen. The seventh hadith, also from Abi Huraira, that the Messenger والسلام, said, The fire has been surrounded with desirous things, and the paradise has been surrounded with things that are a bit unpleasant, or not your favorite thing to do. So if you want to get to Jannah, you have to wade through some stuff that's not so comfortable. Right? It might be a little bit awkward at times. And the fire has been surrounded with things that, mashallah, come easy, it tastes good, hmm? with attractive things. It doesn't mean that all things attractive right, are wrong, and that all things that are difficult are good. Why? The Muslim is an intelligent person, right? And we can understand this macro wisdom as well as make micro estimations and analysis of events and situations. The eighth hadith from Abi Abdullahi Hurdayfa Tabn al Yaman, right, the keeper of the secrets, the Amin of huh, this Ummah, right, which would literally translate as the secretary of this Ummah. Amin is Sir is another word for secretary in uh, Arabic. رضي الله عنهما قال صليت مع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ذات ليلة فافتحها البقرة 
فَقُلْتُ يَرْكَعُ عَنْدَ الْمِئَةِ ثُمَّ مَضَى One night, the Prophet والسلام, I prayed with him, meaning he was in the masjid and he was praying to Hajjid prayer by his own. He didn't tell anyone to join him. And Hudayfa thought it would be a good idea to just right, join up with the Prophet والسلام, Be careful what you wish for. He started a baqarah <laughs> And I said to myself, he's going to make ruku'ah after a hundred verses, but he kept going. And then I said, yusalli biha fi raka'atin. And then I said, well, he's just going to say all of Baqarah in one rakah, but then he kept going. فَقُلْتُ يَرْكَعُ بِهَا Right? And then he's going to, uh, uh, he's going to uh, make ruku'ah. ثُمَّ افْتَتَحَ النِّسَاءَ فَقَرَأَهَا Then he started towards Nisa, and he said the whole thing. And then he started Ali Imran, and he said the whole thing. يَقْرَأُ مُتَرَسِّلًا إِذَا مَرَّ بِآيَةٍ فِيهَا تَسْبِيحٌ سَبَّحٌ Right? He kept on reading, right? Straight on through. And if he, but if he passed a verse that said something about saying SubhanAllah or Tasbih of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would stop and he'd say SubhanAllah. سَبِّحِ اسْمَ رَبِّكَ الْأَعْلَى Right? SubhanAllah. وَإِذَا مَرَّ بِسُؤَالٍ سَأَلْ And if there was a verse that was asking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he would ask of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after that verse. And وَإِذَا مَرَّ بِتَعَوَّذٍ تَعَوَّذٍ And if it had something in it, the verse about, he was interacting with the Qur'an. He was paying attention to the Qur'an. He was responsive to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying on the tongues of his uh, slaves in the Quran, what he's saying they hope for, he would hope for, what he was saying that they celebrate, he would celebrate if he sought refuge, if the mention of seeking refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was mentioned, he would stop and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect him from evil ثُمَّ رَكَعَ فَجَعَلَ يَقُولُ and then he made ruku' and he said سُبْحَانَ رَبِيَ الْعَظِيمِ فَكَانَ رُكُوعُهُ نَحْوًا مِنْ قِيَامِهِ and his ruku' was about as long as his standing. Be careful what you wish for. ثُمَّ قَالَ سَمِعَ اللَّهُ لِمَنْ حَمِدَهُ Then he stood up saying, uh, stood up straight saying, Allah, here is the one that praises him, رَبَّنَا لَكَ الْحَمْدُ ثُمَّ قَامَ قِيَامًا طَوِيلًا قَرِيبًا مِمَّا رَكَعَ And then he stood huh, for a long, long time, close to what he had bowed with. Then he made prostration and said, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la fakana sujooduhu qareeban min qiyamihi and his prostration was close to the length of his qiyam. So that's the mujahida of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But for him, alayhi salatu wa sallam, his intransitive devotions actually end up being transitive because we benefit from them. Ayyadakum Allah. Ahsan Allah ilaykum. We'll draw it to a close then with uh, number nine. Thank you. Do we have any questions or anything going forward? Is that the adhan? Stop for the adhan.